Okay, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Amy Rutledge. I'm one of the biology faculty uh, here at Spoon. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Make Peace with Nature. This isn't my phrase. I'm respectfully borrowing it uh, from UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who has in multiple presentations talked about the war that we humans are waging on the natural world and that we need to make peace with nature. This is also <clears throat> the motto for the upcoming uh, conf uh, Conference of Parties for the Convention of Biodiversity by the United Nations later this year. Their motto for that presentation is peace with nature. So I am borrowing their phrase. Uh, I'm also going to be presenting a uh, good chunk of their data uh, and the blueprint, stuff from the blueprint that they've come up with on how we can uh, fix this problem. Now with war, we usually judge how much damage done in a war is by casualties. Uh, so with the natural world, we do it by extinctions. So an extinction is when a species is lost from the planet. Uh, what you're seeing in this graph is over time, 500 million years, uh, you're looking at the extinction rates of vertebrate um, organisms. So vertebrates, for those of you who may not be familiar with that phrase, are your fish, your amphibians, your reptiles, birds, mammals. Um, extinction is a natural part of the natural world. It's part of evolution. You adapt, you stay adapted. If you are not adapted, you die. Uh, so. Um, we expect extinctions to occur because the ecosystems are constantly changing on Earth. However, there have been times when that extinction rate has exceeded or accelerated significantly above that background rate that we see. And you can see five of them, the five that have occurred in the past 500 million years, are indicated in the graph. Those were the five mass extinctions that have been experienced on Earth. Most of them, it's a variety of reasons, but the overall fact was a, a global-wide climate event uh, that um, happened so quickly that species could not adapt and continue to persist, losing a significant number. The number usually is like 75% of all species lost is what we're looking at. Bringing this up, as you see on the tail end, we're starting to see an uptick again. Um, this uptick, this is uh, data from the United Nations. I'll read this to you. The global rate of species extinction is already at least tens to hundreds of times higher than the average rate over the past 10 million years and is accelerating. Over 1 million of the estimated 8 million species on Earth are substantially at an increased risk of extinction in the coming decades and centuries due to direct or indirect causes by us, human activity. One in eight species are being forced or potentially going to go extinct because of one organism. Not a change, um, some random event that happened to Earth. It's because of one species and what we've been doing. That's that war we've been waging. Now, we're not completely decided if we're moving into the sixth mass extinction, but unless we fix this and the trajectory we're on, we will be moving into another mass extinction event. So, we know from our history that humans have caused extinctions of other species. Giant moa, stellar sea cow, passenger pigeon, pigeon, thylacine, the golden toad, and more recently, the Chinese paddlefish. This is a small selection of a very large number of species that in known time, we have caused the extinction of these organisms. So how are we doing it? In biology, we use an acronym to explain how human activity causes um, species loss. Uh, that an acronym is this, HIPCO. The H is for habitat loss. The I is invasive species. 
one of the two peas, it doesn't matter what order, but I'm gonna go with the bigger one of the two, the size of the human population. The, the second P is pollution. The C, unfortunately, is climate change. In my lifetime, in my educational history, we've added C. When I was a student, first going through undergrad, we didn't have C in this acronym, we now do. The last is over-harvesting. So I'm gonna go through and explain what each one of these are as quickly as I can. Um, so habitat, this is the big one. This is the one that's caused the most damage historically. Um, we have made significant impacts on the ecosystems of this planet. Uh, this graph here is, is from uh, the United Nations uh, report that I'm quoting. Uh, what you see in the circle is basically uh, a, a depiction of all terrestrial ecosystems not covered in ice. And what you should look at is the colorations. Um, the pink is where our cities are. The yellows are our agriculture, um, our cropland. Um, the red is where we're growing animals or um, creating parks and things where we're definitely manipulating the habitat. Uh, the green is where we're going in and harvesting things like um, forestry, going in and removing timber and that type of stuff. Three-fourths, almost, of all terrestrial ecosystems have had significant impacts by human activity. It is just a little over a quarter that is left in what we would consider natural or wild lands. And then it's not shown on here, but the oceans, we have impacted at least two-thirds of that habitat. For I, invasive species, if you don't know what invasive species is, it is a species that has been either introduced or has moved into an ecosystem in which it did not evolve. There are no natural controls over these organisms when they go in there. No natural predators. The food items may not match up correctly. Um, their introduction, we also call them alien and uh, non-native species are the other phrases we use. Uh, they have increased by 40% since 1980. Um, <clears throat> they do extensive damage by out-competing native species. They don't have anything to keep them in check. So they tend to kind of run ramrod over everybody and use everything up, um, uh, causing extinction events of other native species. They also can introduce infectious disease. A uh, good example from human history, when the Europeans came from Europe to the New World, they brought with them disease that decimated the human populations in the New World. It is the exact same concept. You have a non-native species comes in, bringing with it diseases that it is adapted to, but the new ecosystem isn't. That can be devastating. Um, if you don't know, these are, I've got a handful of examples of invasives for North America, for the United States. Uh, the Burmese python, uh, the Japanese beetle, uh, kudzu, zebra mussels, the dreaded starling. <laughs> <laughs> and even more dreaded Asian carp. <laughs> All of these are um, a small list of a very long list of species that we have made it able for them to move into new ecosystems. Human population. Um, our population size has doubled in the past 50 years. In my lifetime, we have doubled the number of people on the planet. Uh, I'm not quite 50 yet. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, our use of resources hasn't just doubled, it's tripled. Uh, we use triple the amount of resources uh, to make things, to produce our energy, to make us food. So we're making even more than we need. This is a sad thing because we make enough food to feed everybody on this planet and there are at least a billion people starving. What's the problem? The problem is we're not distributing it fairly or evenly. The wealthier nations are using more than their fair share of resources, leaving less and medium um, developed nations uh, to fend for themselves. And unfortunately, they end up bearing the biggest brunt of all the damage that we're doing. They're doing the least amount of damage and having to deal with the consequences. 
we here in the U.S. don't deal with anywhere near the amount of consequences that, say, someone in the Indo-Pacific is experiencing today. And if you don't believe me that we have a problem, that's a problem. This is the duration of the human population over the past 10,000 years. And if you note, we don't hit a billion people until 1800. Most of our history, we have been under a population size of 1 billion. We hit that point and we skyrocket. So anybody, what well, you can see on the graph. Last fall, we hit 8 billion. When I was born in 1977, we had just passed 4 billion people. I'm now 46 and we hit 8 billion when I turned 46. That's less than 50 years. Uh, so we've got a real problem. Does anybody know what happened here that set the stage for us to skyrocket like this? My students, you know this, I've told you this before. Anybody tell me what in human society set us up to get going like this? Yes, and the Industrial Revolution. We improved our ability to make food, transport, and we also improved modern, the beginning of modern medicine showed up around that time. Pollution. Uh, plastics in the marine ecosystems have increased tenfold since 1980. Most of the debris in the ocean, trash that came there from us, 68% of that trash is plastics. We now find plastic in every single part of the ocean at every depth. You can go to the furthest point on earth to get away from human civilization and you're going to find plastic. Um, that's a problem. Our production of chemicals that contribute to pollution have significantly increased in the past 20 years or so. We've doubled the amount of chemicals we're producing. <clears throat> and the amount of deaths that we see, premature deaths due to air quality, so air pollution and pollution of our waters, kills millions of people every single year, including in the United States. We still have people dying of poor air quality here in the US. This is a graph of those chemicals. Um, you can see um, the first two lines, the, the red and the blue, are due to agriculture, increased use of fertilizers, increased pesticides, and then the other chemicals that we're producing. Uh, the purple versus the green is the difference between uh, developed and undeveloped nations. It's the developed nations, unfortunately. They're following our bad path. They're redoing what we did, except there's a lot more of them. So the consequences will be larger. Climate change I talk all day about. I don't have time to do that. So I wanted to show you a graph. Uh, on this graph um, are three groups of organisms, uh, insects, birds, mammals, plants. Um, the three columns show the percentage of those groups of organisms where, 50 where they will lose 50% of their geographic range due to climate change. In other words, whatever, however high on that bar you are, that percentage of those, so that first bar over there, um, over the 1.5, is about 6%. So 6% of all insects will lose 50% of their geographic range due to climate change. The different bars for each group are the different climate scenarios. How quickly or how much um, warming we end up with. For reference, we are at 1.1, 1.2. That's 1.5. We're going to hit 1.5. We're fairly confident. It's can we avoid hitting the others? Um, and these may not seem that significant, but insects, that first group, do you remember the number I said at the very beginning? How many species we think we have on the planet? 8 million species. 5.5 million of those 8 million species are insects. So that is a lot of organisms that are going to be significantly impacted, and they make a major impact on ecosystem function. Uh, last one is over-harvesting. OK, so I'm just going to bring it up here. Uh, we do a lot of things where we overuse the organisms in the environment. Um, animals and plants, we harvest them for food. Uh, so we hunt animals. Uh, we grow crops to provide us food. 
We also hunt animals because some people find that enjoyable or they fish for them. Um, we collect in addition to food, we get things like pelts, you know, fur, antlers, trophies. We like trophies um, that we get from them. Um, we draw a lot of medicine and our knowledge of medicine from the research we do on these organisms. So we're pulling them out to do that kind of work. Uh, pet trade and collection. We like to keep them in our homes as pets, right? We like tropical fish. We like exotic birds. Um, they have to come from somewhere. So the question is, do you ask the question, where did it come from? Was it a wild caught species? or was it one farm for the purpose for the pet trade? Um, so those are important questions to have. Collection of plants. How many of you keep house plants? I do, I love house plants. It's the same thing. You've gotta ask the question, where are they coming from? Um, because in some cases, some of these organisms are being pulled directly out of the wild, and that is having severe impacts on their size of their populations. So, I don't like to be the Debbie Downer. <laughs> so that's a lot of negative to throw at you. What can we do? Uh, the report that they put out um, has a long list for different groups of people on what they can do. So I've kind of pulled out some of the stuff that the average person can do to combat this. You're doing it right now. The first one is you get educated. You learn. You take my environmental science class, OK? <laughs> um, by doing that, you learn about how we link uh, the fact that we are not separate from the environment, we are part of it. It has a direct impact on your health. Um, you need to understand how we interact with the environment when we harness and make energy, or better yet, how we make anything. Anything you buy at the store, how did they make it? Where did it come from? What resources were used? Same with your food, ask the same questions. And then most importantly, start to work on your friends and your family because that's who you're going to have an impact with. Have the conversation about it. You learn something new, by all means, please share. And then start showing, um, exhibiting, promoting that some of these changes can be socially acceptable and not weird. You go to my house, we don't have paper napkins. We don't have Kleenex. It's all cloth. It's not that big of a deal. It's kind of weird when you first oh, am I going to reuse this cloth napkin to uh, blow my nose or whatever? But I haven't bought those paper products in years. I reuse the same stuff by washing the washing machine. You just get used to some of the changes that can have a big impact. Um, promote sustainable consumption. Really right here, the almighty dollar. You have an impact on what companies do because you decide where to spend your money. Think about who and where you're buying your food. Are they doing the right thing? The products that you use in your everyday life, did the company that make it do it the right way or did they do it the wrong way? Maybe you should think about finding another company. Um, reduce the amount of energy you're consuming. And if you're able to, Make the decision to start using cleaner energy. Get away from fossil fuels. <clears throat> and of course, uh, in the light of climate change, it is our most pressing problem. Habitat significant. Climate is urgent. We've got to do something now. We are running up against a time frame where we're running out of time to stop a very serious crash in our uh, global ecosystem. And then lastly, live in the land of the free. You've got civic rights. Um, support changes, and a lot of these are things that you can't do as an individual, but our governments can, and private industry can. So support those individuals that are trying to make changes, moving away from unsustainable industries like fossil fuels. Um, start thinking about the cost of the products that we're using. Right now, we don't pay for a lot of the damage that we're doing to the environment. It's just free in the cost of products. If we actually paid for the cost of the damage that we're doing, prices would be higher, and you sure as heck would be rethinking your choices on what you're doing and where you're spending your money. Um, we need to rethink how we grow our food, how we take care of our water, and 
um, how we provide energy, and most importantly, making sure that everybody gets a fair share equally across the globe, not just in the wealthy countries. Um, and we need to hold those people accountable. So, how do you do this? You speak up, you say something, you participate in the conversation, and most importantly, you do that. I'm not kidding. You go out and you vote for the people that are going to make and support these changes. Because um, that is where we're going to get the big changes made, through governmental change. Um, and I, real quick, I know I'm about running out of time. Um, I know we can do it because we've got these. Can you tell me what this is? This is the bald eagle, is it not? The bald eagle. 1782. We adopted this as our national symbol. We chose this because it is a magnificent animal. At the time, anecdotally, we don't have hard data, but anecdotally, the bald eagle was so um, widespread, we uh, expected to have about 100,000 breeding pairs. 1800s, we start to see declines in bird populations across the board for a variety of reasons. And then the 1940s come along, so we start using DDT. DDT is a pesticide. The government told us it was safe. You can Google images of the government officials spraying people. Parents encourage their children to follow the fog trucks because if they were in that chemical, it would protect them from getting polio. They were confident there was nothing wrong with it. And then we started looking. 1963, 400s are emotional. 417 pairs. 1972, after an uprising from a lot of environmentalists, if you've heard of the Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, she was one of the ones that led the way. Um, the complaints that the government was using chemicals without doing thorough research on what those effects were got um, DDT banned. 1972 that summer, actually they, they pulled the permits and by the end of the year you were not allowed to use DDT. The problem with DDT is that it won't kill the bald eagle, but what it does is it prevents them from laying down a solid shell around a egg. So when the female would lay down on the egg, she'd crash the egg. Uh, so for a very long time we had no greedy eagles. 1978, actually it's a little bit earlier than this, but the official Endangered Species Act goes into play in 1978. Bald eagle is one of the first species on the endangered list. By 1990, by the way, remember I was born in 1977? Goes on the list in 1978. By 1995, the year I graduated high school, the eagles have recovered enough that we pull them off the endangered list and we put them on the threat list. Still protected, but not as critical. By 2007, we're up to almost 10,000 breeding pairs, and we don't need them on that list anymore. This is where we are today, 72,000. And when I was a kid, I never saw a bald eagle in the wild. Those of you of my generation didn't see him. Where did we see him? We saw him in a zoo or on TV. It's the only place you see them. Yesterday, I saw three of them. <laughs> three people, two on my way into work, and one on the way going home. So to me, this is hope. Thank you.